Dr. Kels is another one of our partners who has a really dynamic skill set and practices all aspects of the laryngology head neck surgery. Good morning. I want to make sure, is that loud enough, everybody? Okay, so well, good morning, and thank you, Ryan. He uh, asked me to speak, speak about neck masses, and that's kind of near and dear to my heart because on a daily basis it comes in, so it's very comfortable for me to talk to you about that. Um, but they also come into your offices. Um, uh, with neck masses, it's very important to have a broad differential diagnosis because when they come in, what's their differential diagnosis? Cancer, right? Every single time I have cancer, oh my God, I'm, I'm freaking out. And so you want to have something to direct them, make them feel a little bit more comfortable. You want to uh, send them in the right direction, start the initial workup appropriately, have a good broad differential diagnosis, and then narrowing that down so that you're uh, getting them in the right direction is very important. In my lecture, I'm trying to include a lot of my own patients because <clears throat> you're going to be seeing these patients too. I'm a community surgeon, and if I'm seeing them, you're seeing them, so they're walking into your door. So I have no disclosures. And we basically talked about our objectives. So this is what we're talking about. And as we were taught by our mentors, when you walk in the room, the first great, the, the best workup starts with the history and physical. And you're going to learn a lot from the history and physical. I can usually tell pretty well what I'm dealing with within a few minutes of seeing and hearing the patient. So we want to know, first of all, age of presentation. You know, are they an older patient or are they a child in our office with their parent? Um, did it come up suddenly? Certainly, uh, sudden things arise um, are more usually inflammatory, where something uh, slow and, and progressive over time is going to be a little bit more concerning for a neoplastic process. And uh, what are the locations? We can start narrowing things down. Um, we want to know, is it a, a hard and solid and fixed mass, or is this something very soft and movable? Is it kind of fluctuant and volatile? Um, we want to know some characteristics. Did they have fevers and chills? Are they in a lot of pain, or is it painless? Um, how about their voice? Is their voice good? If they're ra really raspy, they could have a, a vocal cord paralysis from a thyroid cancer, or they could have a, a lesion on their vocal cord that is metastasized to their neck. Um, what about ear pain? That's one we ask about a lot. Um, ear pain can be a sign of something coming from the base of tongue and causing a, a cancer that is metastasized to the neck, and their ear pain kind of tells you, well, this is something, you know, there might be something in the throat that's actually the source of this. Um, I like to re, you know, remind you to examine them very well. You want to look in their, if they have a neck mass, let's say in the posterior triangle, you want to look in their hairline. They may have a melanoma that's metastasized to the neck. Um, are they having any nasal problems, nasal bleeding? They may have had a nasopharyngeal carcinoma that's causing a problem that's went to their neck. So um, we think cancer, and there are all obviously a lot of non-cancerous things that we'll go over as well. Uh, so we're going to try to differentiate things by age. We're going to try to use where they are. And then we're going to start building a list of congenital inflammatory, neoplastic, and infectious causes. So age of presentation is very important. Um, I kind of broke it down to under 15, 15 to 40, and over 40. 40 is kind of an important number. They did some old uh, um, epidemiologic studies and then showed that 50% um, uh, of masses over age 40 and, uh, were present, that presented were actually neoplastic. And uh, a good proportion of those um, uh, it says 90%, but a good proportion of those were, were malignant. The most common malignancy is squamous cell carcinoma. Um, and then um, next coming would be uh, lymphoma. Under age 15, and really under age 40, we're looking at mostly in congenital and inflammatory things. And uh, under age 15, you do have to think about cancer. That's going to be the parent's first concern. And the number one thing that should come to your head if you were going to give them an answer of what cancers could be there should be lymphoma. That would be probably the most common in childhood. There is neuroblastoma, very few of us actually see that, but that occurs a little bit younger. And then rhabdomyosarcoma, and uh, certainly even thyroid cancers and parotid cancers can occur in kids. But for the most part, you're looking at lymphoma if it is neoplastic. And um, in the setting of kids, it's mostly going to be inflammatory. It's mostly going to be in benign stuff. 15 to 40, I put that in there. It's an interesting age range right now because um, and you may have heard of the buzzwords about HPV causing oral pharyngeal cancer. So a month ago, 38-year-old walks into my office with a neck mass. I needle biopsy him. He's squamous cell carcinoma. Um, hard conversation to have with a 38-year-old. So we have to consider that. But you know, I didn't probably start with the first thing saying to him, this is probably cancer. Um, but I built that differential, and, and I kind of got him there. And, uh, and the, uh, as an interesting side note, I. Um, to soften the blow, I try to pitch it as the, the, the cancerous viral infection so that it kind of seems like an infection, but it is cancer. Um, interestingly, um, same, same kind of age group, about 
Um, six weeks ago, I had a 24-year-old walk in with a neck mass right here, and it ends up being papillary thyroid carcinoma. So I'd like to mention that thyroid cancer also is, is picking up, at least in our, our uh, detection, and certainly that's something that can present in, a, in that 15 to 40 range. So we're going to break it up into the lateral neck on the side and in the middle, the central compartment. The lateral neck is going to be composed of the submandibular region, um, the lateral chain, and the posterior triangle. The um, submandibular region, you're going to have a lot of oral cavity stuff that goes there, or the submandibular gland that can get infected. Um, the lateral chain is going to be kind of the, the, the main drainage basin, so you're going to get the jugular chain of lymph nodes, including the jugular digastric. You have to kind of pay attention that right up in here you have the tail of the parotid that can kind of creep into that area and fool you. And then you have the posterior triangle where a lot of the stuff from the scalp, nasal pharynx, and posterior will go, except maybe one contributor will be the thyroid because it interestingly goes along the side. We'll go through that some more. And then here's the central compartment, you know, basically right down the middle, and you're looking at a submental, over the hyoid, over the thyroid, suprasternal region. We're going to go through these and kind of build our differential. So the lateral neck mass, by far most common lymphadenopathy. In fact, everyone in this room probably will experience this in their life. And um, uh, we'll go through the, you know, the, 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 the most common of that, but that's going to be the most common thing that we see in general uh, under age 40. Um, then we have uh, salivary gland abnormalities, brachial cleft cysts, um, some uh, 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 unusual things like laryngocele. We have a lot of neoplastic. I probably should have included that over here, but it's, it kind of behaves in inflammatory fashion. Um, we have the neoplastic. Most common is going to be metastasis. Then we have uh, lymphoma, and that's probably over age 40 going to be the majority of the, of the kind of bad things if you kind of take out thyroid, which we're, we just have a higher detection rate on now. Kind of rare things I won't really get into, paraganglioma, carotid body tumors, vagal paragangliomas, kind of interesting things that can present in the lateral neck mass. Um, they, uh, they're attached to the carotid artery, so there's an interesting Fontaine sign where they'll, they'll move side to side, but they won't go up and down, and that's because they're attached. But, um, uh, and then lipoma, we'll go through in just a minute. So lateral neck mass. This is a kiddo of mine who presented, um, I wouldn't have thought of this, but uh, he was five and he got his first dental cleaning and the next day his neck started swelling and the next day and the next day and the next day and he went to his pediatrician got a course of antibiotics and it kept getting worse and literally the mom was told nobody will help me so he came to they came to my they actually got a hold of my wife came to my office and um and i said we're actually going to go to the or i think so we put him in the hospital put him on iv antibiotics and uh, i did an incision and drainage um and it was mostly uh pre-limp there was some lymphadenitis and i kind of curataged some of that out and end up being a, a streptococcus infection from the oral cavity. So lymphadenitis affects a lot of us, um, and you know, most of this is going to be bacterial. Um, we want to think about the granulomatous diseases. Um, you know, around here we have uh, coccidiomycosis, there's histoplasmosis in some regions, um, cat scratch, which is Bartonella hensli, um, uh, sarcoidosis, which would be rare, uh, but uh, certainly in the differential, especially if they got little skin abnormalities and some dyspnea. Um, tuberculosis, so that doesn't just include um, um, mycobacterium tuberculosis, you got to think about the atypical TBs. This could easily have been the exact same picture for a kiddo who had this progressing over a month or a month and a half and it was more, a little bit more bluish in color. It would look just like this and that's a typical TB. They get it from playing in the dirt and it gets up in their mouth. Um, and then actinomycosis, maybe an older adult with a presentation a little bit further back. Um, the stories I heard was, you know, farmers would eat straw and they would get it in their throat and it would, it would come down into their neck. I've never seen a real draining case of actinomycosis. Viral, so when you think viral, just think all the mono-like symptoms. Think mono and then build yourself a differential. You know, you got Epstein-Barr and the very young CMV, if they haven't been exposed yet, they'll present almost exactly the same and then HIV can kind of mimic some of this stuff. And then you can throw in like tularemia and some rare, rare things, but mono-like illnesses. And then lastly, I just want to throw in some of the weird inflammatory things. Um, Castleman's disease, Kawasaki's disease, that's the, the kiddo, two to three, who is very irritable, uh, feverish for five days. And he'll actually act like he has a, or she, will act like they have a neck abscess. They'll just sit stiff and you touch their neck and they'll cry and scream. It's the most irritable kids. And then their, their lips and fingers are desquamating and they got conjunctivitis. Um, they just look very sick. PFAPA, it's a little bit controversial, but you know, the kid who has recurrent tonsillitis, big lymph nodes, and has tons of aphthous ulcers. 
Um, and those kids actually do very well taking their tonsils out. So one of the more common um, things that are not lymphadenitis that we're going to see in the under 40 population is a branchial cleft cyst in the lateral neck. And uh, the most common is a type 2. I included some of the embryology and basically the branchial arches have some clefts in between and those clefts kind of fuse and close, but sometimes in, that, in, in, that, in doing that they kind of invaginate a, a residual uh, um, cyst or sinus. Most commonly it's going to start right at the anterior SCM and the most common is type 2 where it courses all the way up um, over, between the carotid ar uh, internal and external carotid artery into the um, uh, tonsil fossa, there's actually a connection and often you can actually find that connection. And um, type 2 is most common. I have seen type 3 and 4, I actually present the case to you here in a minute. Um, and really hard to differentiate this, I called mine type 4, but you can't really, it's hard to differentiate because they end at the piriform sinus and this, this cyst can go all the way down to the lower neck. And so all you see is infection here, and you find a source here, and you don't know if it courses in a three or four manner. Um, type 1 is up by the ear canal. You guys will rarely see this, but if you have a mass in the face draining into the ear, so you get like a face mass and an ear drainage, then it could be this type of a brachial cleft cyst. It's basically a duplication of the external auditory canal, and it gets a little bit more complex, but basically cystic face mass and a draining ear. So let's give you a type 2. This is a young lady um, who had a left-sided neck presentation. Almost always comes after like, I got a cold, it swells up, it's painful, they gave me antibiotics, it went down, but it didn't go away. And she's under 40, she's young. And so you, you palpate it and uh, it's kind of fluctuant. And so uh, we get a CT scan and we see this very unilocular cystic mass. Now in our offices, we immediately think, well this could be cancer, because we're always thinking that. But you know, when you have that right presentation, you have to kind of keep in mind that there's a lot of benign things. And I had one in like a 74-year-old the other day, and immediately I think cancer, and, and it ended up not being cancer. But anyways, so she presented after infection. We treated with antibiotics. It went down, but it didn't go away, and we saw this mass. And so here I am taking it out. Here's the cystic mass. It kind of coursed up towards her tonsil. I couldn't get a shot where it showed you go all the way to the tonsil, but it went that way. I cross-clamp it. You know, we have to be very careful. They talk about the ninth and 12th nerve, but the one I see all the time is the one to the shoulder, the spinal accessory. And it's always fun and intraoperatively. You touch it uh, with a stimulator and it jumps and it scares your, uh, your first assist. So it's kind of a fun <laughs> moment. So here's this lady, young gal, 18, came from Nebraska, and she presented with this swelling right here in her neck and, um, and uh, was referred by an ENT in Nebraska to me because he happened to know me. And uh, it was kind of like a, well, here you go. It was really kind of awesome of him. And uh, he looked down into the throat, and he saw at the left piriform sinus, which is way down at the bottom of the side of the throat, he saw a fistula, genius moment on his part. He sticks a cautery needle in it and burns it. Actually, not necessarily a bad decision. It might have worked, but it didn't. And it kind of created an inflammation with bacteria. It seeded down, and she presented with an abscess right there. So then somebody very smartly did an incision and drainage because it was infected and she was sick. That went away, and this is how she comes to me. Now there's a new mass further down, there's this scar, and I know there's a connection up here. So I made an incision here to here, I cut that out, I went down, removed all this tissue, I actually had to make another incision right here, removed the whole thyroid gland, and I tracked it up, and it was this beautiful cord, I wish I had taken a picture, and it went right to the piriform sinus, and I had to cut it, cross, uh, uh, over sew it and purse string it and uh, she did great. Um, and that last time I've heard she had no recurrences. But I don't know if it was the three or four but I'm telling everyone it was a four because that's a zebra and I don't get to see many zebras. Um, salivary gland neoplasm, so I talked about that tail of parotid region you need to think about. I can't tell you how many times people have been sent to me with a swollen lymph node, it ends up being a, a salivary neoplasm. So here's the CT and you can see the mandible, you can see um, this is a, a parotid gland and it usually is kind of, you can't really see it well, but it's kind of like a triangle and it's kind of, uh, kind of a hypodense area with a blood vessel in it and over here you can very clearly see a, a tumor. And this was very low in the tail of parotid, so it did present, and sometimes we don't know. We're like, ah, you know, this could be parotid or this could be a jugular degastric lymph node. Pretty cool if you can tell them that. All of a sudden, they feel like, it's just that empowering moment. We're in control. We know what can be here, and I'm going to get you to the right guy to take care of it. Um, so reassuring to them, 80% of parotid things are benign in adults and kids, actually. So 80% of parotid tumors are benign. Submandibular gland, the one up in the front, a little bit different. 50% of the neoplasms that grow there are cancerous. 
But 80% are benign. The most common is a benign tumor called a pleomorphic adenoma. And so I got a picture of one for you. So here is uh, that same patient with the mass removed. It's right here. And you can see, so one of the interesting things about this is the facial nerve goes through the parotid gland. And we have to go down, find the nerve, and cut this tumor off of the nerve. Um, Underappreciated surgery. It takes a, a few hours. And uh, in the end, we're really worried that their face will move. And, and she, did it. Um, she did it very well. All right. This is the one that isn't mine. These are pretty rare, but uh, performing Valsalva too excessively can lead to uh, what's called a laryngocele, which is a dilation of the ventricle, which is the part right above the, um, right above the vocal cord under the false vocal fold. There's this little cave, and it can, if they're like a trumpet blower, they can start making an out pouch, and they can create this, this dilation that actually goes out through the thyroid membrane and sticks out in the neck, and you can surgically remove it. Sometimes they're small through the mouth and sometimes uh, uh, through the neck. Um, rare. I've seen, I've, I've operated on a couple, but they're just not very common. Um, so lateral neck considerations. We talked about the differential, but I want to just make a few um, quick points, and I already kind of made them. Posterior neck compartment. So way back here, you want to think to yourself, could this, if, if there's a mass there, either it started there like a lymphoma, it came there from like um, the scalp or the nasopharynx or the thyroid. Why the thyroid? It's right in the middle. We have this thing called the transverse cervical artery, and the lymph nodes love to travel along it. And so pretty much most of our metastases from thyroid cancer, we follow that artery out and take out all the lymph nodes that are associated with it. Um, I wanted to make the re reiterate that level two, you want to think jugular digastric lymph node or tail of parotid neoplasm. And remember that the jugular digastric lymph node is that first drainage stop away from the tonsil, and it's supposed to be a little bit bigger. Most of the lymph nodes should be about a centimeter or less, I mean, and uh, the jugular digastric can be up to a centimeter and a half. Supraclavicular, so not in the posterior triangle, but more anterior. You can still think thyroid, but you've got to start thinking lymphoma. TB will present there. And then anything respiratory abdominal. I mean, you know, gastric, I mean, I listed some breast, lung, kidney, gastric, a whole bunch of things can metastasize up to that area. So central compartment, now we're going to build the, the middle, the middle diagnoses. And so pretty much it comes down to a few things. It's either like when they're older, it's either a lymph node or the thyroid. And when they're younger, it's probably a thyroglossal duct cyst. Um, but you can think of ranula, dermoid, and a lipoma. I'll show a few of these. So a thyroglossal duct cyst, the back of the tongue has a little invagination in embryology that is uh, uh, called the foramen cecum. It starts to invaginate and descend. It goes through the hyoid. I remember this class in, in med school. And it goes through the hyoid, and it, it lies right where the thyroid is, and then becomes the thyroid gland. And sometimes it doesn't go away. So in its descent, we have to consider the hyoid bone, because it can go basically right through or behind it and then intimately attach with it. So when we take this thing out, it's usually on the CT scan. It's right in the middle. When they stick their tongue out, it moves up and down. And, um, uh, we have to take out the central portion of the hyoid when you do it. And once you clip that central portion of the hyoid bone, that floating bone, you get behind it, there's another, another layer to the tract, and you've got to clamp it up really high by the, by the tongue base. So I got a picture. So in general, I would say ultrasound is fine for this. You want to check for the thyroid gland when you refer. It would be very rare. They used to do radionuclide scans to see if they had thyroid tissue in their tongue base. But basically, if they have a thyroid, that means it didn't stop the descent and it, and it went all the way. There are some people who can stop their descent and have a lingual thyroid, but really rare. Uh, but anyways, I think an ultrasound is fine in the initial evaluation because it's usually a kid. And you want to just make sure that when they do that, they also um, comment on the thyroid gland. And then you can send them on, and it's a surgical disease. We take it out and in addition to that central portion of the hyoid. So this was an 18-year-old who had a swelling right there in the submental space. And when I looked at her mouth, I'm like, you know, your tongue is, is very high. So we did a CT scan and we found this cystic, unilocular but cystic mass underneath the, underneath the tongue. And, uh, you know, once I came up with, well, you know, this is what it could be, this is what it would be, this is what it would be, the mom's like, I want it out now. So this was removed. This picture was on December 31st. <laughs> I'll never forget it because I left there, went home to, to change to go out that evening. So, um, interestingly, it presented the neck, but I, I took it out through the mouth, and it was just an impressive picture just to see how big these dermoids. So a dermoid is a, two, a germ, la germ layer uh, tumor. Um, I guess it can be three. I think it's just two for a dermoid. And, uh, and they're basically like a big keratinous cyst. When you take them out, you cut them, it's just like that cheesy stuff comes out. It's really gross. Um, 
but it has this beautiful capsule around it. So dissecting it was, was a pretty picture. And, and I could see everything kind of splayed out. It went all the way to her base. You can't tell this on here. It went all the way to her base of tongue. It was a very big mass. Um, thyroid, I just say thyroid usually presents as a midline neck mass, but it can be a lateral. And this is, again, one of my patients. Look how big this thyroid is. So this just looks fatty because it's pushed up. And I didn't actually completely cut it out yet. I left it attached because I was just like, Oh my God, this is the biggest thyroid. When I took it out, it went all the way up behind her jawbone. It was up in her uh, 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 upper, almost oral, well, it wasn't the oral pharynx. And this shows how it went behind the, uh, the um, thyroid cartilage. But anyways, um, she just presented with fullness everywhere. So it was a little bit more uh, simple that there was something deep and big going on. But I just want to remind you, thyroid is one of those things, um, or lymph nodes associated with thyroid. We do have a Delphian lymph node, which can be associated with a laryngeal cancer. But for the most part, you're going to be looking at thyroid stuff when it's there in the midline. Ranula, I just threw it in for completeness sake. And it's a blocked sublingual gland. It can extend through the myohyoid. Usually when I have to take these out, I can take them out transorally. But sometimes you have to do a combined and split the myohyoid to get up in there. So, you know, your imaging modalities, what should you guys be doing? Well, first of all, I would say the workhorse for us is a CT scan of the neck with contrast. I would kind of reiterate the contrast part because very often if they are done without contrast, you're trying to kind of help this patient by not making anything more traumatic than they need to be. But then we can't differentiate the blood vessels from the lymph nodes. And so if it's lateral neck, you really, if you're going to do a CT scan, you should add contrast unless there's a major contraindication. But really, for you guys, maybe ultrasound would be the workhorse that I would go with. I would say when you do an ultrasound, ask them to do the thyroid. I mean, I guess you could skip it in a kid, but I usually include it because what are we, you know, what, the information can be helpful. And the number I want you to look for is 1.5 centimeters. I said lateral neck, 1 centimeter is normal or less, and jugular digastric, 1.5, but that's the number. 1.5 centimeters, I got a lumper bump, my finger, it's bigger than my fingertip, which is about a, mine's about a centimeter, Man, mine's probably like 13 millimeters, but it's bigger than my fingertip, and they're worried about it, I'm going to get an ultrasound. And uh, you can consider MRI really good for like a paraganglioma or a lipoma. I did include this, this was a normal CT scan, and this guy comes in with this third turkey gobbler hanging down, and uh, it was a lipoma, and so sometimes even the radiologists are wrong. And I had to call them a den the note because insurance wouldn't cover it until it said there was something wrong on the scan. Um, so was that yeah, you can see it right there. Contrast, contrast, contrast. Um, fine needle aspiration. Uh, so now we've built our differential, we've localized it, and now we're going to do. Uh, uh, we do, I've got our imaging, and we now, well, if it's a cystic lesion, we could do a fine needle aspiration, and aspirating will give us cystic fluid, and if it's a solid lesion, we're going to get some tissue out of it. I just wanted to point out with fine needle, there's a lot we can do with it. We can do RPMI and get flow cytometry and look for lymphoma. We uh, can use P16 in a cancer and differentiate, hey, by the way, you've got an HPV-related cancer, which is a better prognosis. The staging is different. And, um, and, uh, and our approach is probably going to be the same, but the staging is different. And then you can do PCR uh, for uh, TB and Epstein-Barr virus. Um, so there's a lot you can do with this. And genetic testing for the thyroid gland, we do a firma testing, which I'll show a picture of. So best for solid lesions, watch for the pulse tile lesions. When it's right over the carotid and I'm feeling pulsing and it's really, even I will get a scan before I just poke it with a needle. So, and then you can always order it. Uh, ultrasound guided so that maybe if you don't have this availability in your office, you don't have to do it. This is my setup. I have Cytolite was what we wash it in. That's kind of the, the workhorse here for, for evaluating. They spin it down and get the cells out. RPMI, it's a pink solution. That's for the lymphoma. Um, I fix it in carnoy and alcohol, and then I have dry slides and the, the frosted glasses and clear glass. And so we send this all to Scottsdale Pathology to do a wonderful job, and they help me to make some good um, decisions. Um, there's all kinds of criteria, which I just don't have time to go into. I can always answer those questions if you have them later. And then, um, and then this is a firma testing. So like in the thyroid, we can actually do genetic testing. They'll do it sometimes in the lateral neck. But uh, it can take somebody who's kind of in a medium category, we don't know what it is, and tell us if it's more chance of malignant or more chance of benign. Um, there's just a picture of what an FNA looks like. This happens to be papillary, monolayer, sheet of cells, intranuclear inclusions, powdery chromatin. So... We find a nodule. One of the strong recommendations by the Academy, and he mentioned this in our, in our pre-operative or our, uh, uh, pre-lecture uh, questions, was 
Use of antibiotics is only for suspicion, suspicion of uh, infectious etiology. This has been there for three months. It hasn't changed. It doesn't bother them. Don't put them on antibiotics. Get the imaging. You're just delaying their treatment while you're waiting. But presented last week, absolutely. Presented last month, I mean, I think even the kid that presented to me who was 38, who presented with a neck mask, I would have had no problem putting him on antibiotics. He had that, what, for three weeks? Yeah, sure, why not? I mean, I think, though, in general, they're trying to stop that delay of progression towards getting us to treatment. Uh, treatment. So special considerations, I mentioned them before, 15 to 40, HPV-related oral pharyngeal cancer, thyroid cancer. Thyroid, I actually don't want you to get too crazy about I think it's a little, you know, we, uh, Ashok Shah said there's as many Thyroid, there's as many thyroid articles written as there are thyroid cancers in the world. And that's because we put a lot into thyroid cancer. And because of that, our incidence is climbing because we're looking for it a lot. But I had a 24-year-old three, four weeks ago. And uh, she was found when she was getting her hernia evaluated. It was very fun to do a combined hernia thyroid surgery, by the way. Um, and then uh, HPV-related oral pharyngeal. So, I mean, the age range is dropping. He wasn't a smoker. He wasn't, he was married. He wasn't particularly promiscuous. Um, it's HPV 16 and there's some other serotypes and they just are really changing, you know, the game a little bit. Fortunately, most people um, um, don't uh, end up with that. And I told him after they're treated, like in his case, I said, once we're done with the chemo and radiation, you're actually, uh, they're actually cured of the HPV. It actually eradicates the HPV as well. And so their chance is, is very low of ever getting it again. Um, so, and then my son, who is aspiring to follow my footsteps. <laughs>